All right, so uh, good afternoon, and uh, I'm Avinash Valarapu, as you could see here, but you may call me Avi. Uh, that could be simple, the first three letters of my first name. And uh, yeah, I'm currently working for Spurcona as a support tech lead, and uh, I think most of us have seen the news that uh, Percona has started supporting Postgres starting from July 1st. So yeah, that's why you could see Percona and myself now. <laughs> So, okay, um, so I'm going to talk uh, more about uh, one of the POCs that we have done uh, some time back later, which got implemented, of course. But uh, so it was a migration of a five node Oracle rack to PostgreSQL. So um, I think there, there have been several talks in the past where people have talked about uh, how to migrate Oracle to Postgres or how to, you know, what data type to choose for what. And apart from that, like how to migrate your stored procedures, what are the tools available. There, there are several documentations available. There are several tools like ORA2PG, schema conversion tool, or you know, DMS. Like, th there are several things around in the market. Everybody have been uh, watching all the uh, you know, stuff around since quite a long time. So I may not actually repeat uh, most of the stuff, but I'm going to talk about uh, you know, an experience that um, we had in the past and uh, also the problem statement at that point of time and how we resolved it, um, what is it that we did in Postgres to make it uh, Oracle-like Postgres, right? And um, also, it's just to uh, give that trust and confidence to everybody that if you think about migration, it's not that, oh, Oracle to Postgres migration, I mean, it's huge. I don't think everything that's possible with Oracle is possible in Postgres. I mean, it's just to get away from all those uh, thoughts. Um, um, you know, I, I was I was just uh, talking to talk. I mean, thinking to talk about only a few of the things uh, uh, which are really important for all of us. Yeah, this has been one of the diagrams that we have been looking at since quite a long time. I know numerous uh, times, like DB Engine ranking, and uh, we have touched that 400 score, and Postgres has only been that database along with MongoDB, which has always had that positive trend, which actually indicates that there are a lot many migrations happening to Postgres. And uh, I'm not sure if everybody has seen the Postgres 11 release notes and the next release roadmaps, but it should be quite interesting for all of us to see where Postgres is going towards. I mean, if we think, uh, it takes time to get up to Oracle features. Actually, that's like not a right way of thinking um, because it has already got to that stage and it has actually got much more better things happening at Postgres, right? So, yeah. So I'm going to talk about Oracle Fine Order Act to Postgres for sure. What are the tools that we have used for migration? And uh, now we'll talk about Oracle Enterprise. Uh, software, and uh, we have RMAN, all the other backup tools. What kind of backup tools can I use for Postgres for that equivalent uh, backup strategy that I can set up? And at the same time, what are the parameters that I need to really concentrate on once I want to migrate to Postgres or get a better performance with PostgreSQL? Um, I, will I get the same TPS as Oracle, or will I get the same performance as Oracle? If I have a business logic or if I have uh, um, you know, any of the complex queries running. Um, and also apart from that, how can I, I have a lot of business logic, how can I tune my stored procedures? What can I do to see where the problem is? How I can, co I mean, how I can modify my stored procedures to go ahead and um, you know, fit it well for Postgres? And uh, I know with the community or the vanilla of Postgres that I get, I may not get everything that I need to make it like Oracle. Are there any other extensions that I can create you know, that are supported by community or available uh, for, I mean, as an open source extension, of course, right, that I can use to achieve Oracle-like feature? Right? So we are going to talk most of um, all these today. First, I'll get to the diagram of uh, what we have seen when you know, I was talking to the customer. So the customer said, okay, we have a fine old Oracle rack and we have 10 application servers connecting and doing a lot of writes. 
right? And um, yeah, the reason why I highlighted that storage is because we know it's a shared storage architecture, right? I mean, high availability rack with uh, shared storage, uh, multi-master you call it, or whatever with the interconnect, right? So, uh, so this was the diagram presented to us. Now, what's happening was, uh, like, they have a fine node Oracle rack and 10 application servers always writing and even for reporting. So you could see the specifications, like it's a 48 CPU machine, each of the servers, 120 GB RAM, Oracle 11 GR2, recently they have upgraded, OEL7, and database size, 800 GB. When I say database size, 800 GB, I know most of us could be from the Oracle background. It's a logical database size, like it's 800 GB that is accessible from any of the nodes. It's not like 800 GB in each rack node, right? I mean, I know, I know like most of us are aware of Oracle Rack. 10 application servers. So what customers said is like, now after new acquisitions, we have increased the product base. Definitely the transactions per second are expected to grow more. And several thousands of vendors being added, extensive reporting happening and there is license cost involved. So should we scale vertically or add more rack nodes? What should we do? Or can we think about Postgres now at this point of time? Do you think you can save our license cost and get us the same kind of performance with Postgres and uh, you know, help us save some license cost and achieve very good performance the same way? Now, OK. This is the point where most of the database administrators or the developers or the program managers start thinking like, OK, this kind of um, uh, strategy that may work, may not work, or very complex. But in order to proceed further, right, what we did was we first understood the history, where they started from, and uh, how they got to five nodes, and what's happening in the machine right now. And uh, can we see by learning from the application, the way application connects to the database, and um, apart from that, the way transactions are happening in the database, can we see some pattern with which we can say like, okay, we can rather change the design this way or you know, migrate to Postgres in this, using some of the design. We just wanted to see the history. So what we understood was when they started, there were a two node rack they just had two schemas and 50 application modules. So what happens was, I mean, among those two schemas, one was kind of a global schema that has got you know, all the SKUs as well as the vendor details. So some kind of schema which is always static and one schema which was always taking writes. And then they slowly got up to a fine node rack, like six schemas, 750 application modules. When I say six schemas, what's happening was, leaving that common schema aside, there were five schemas which were actually kind of independent to each other. They're not dependent to each other, of course. That's why there's five separate schemas. And each of the schema corresponds to a certain application logic. So there are a certain type of orders that actually write to one schema, certain type of orders that write to a second schema. So that way, they had multiple schemas. And uh, depending on the type of orders chosen on the web, they are redirected to the ap appropriate application server. And in Oracle, we know whenever we are using Rack, most of the Oracle Rack environments I've observed, they have got dedicated services created on the database uh, Rack I mean, each of the service has got like preferred instance and an available instance. So for example, you have a fine node rack in this example, right? You have service one, service two, service three, service four, and service five. Like you could see in this diagram, any application that's actually like, you know, uh, writing to schema one, it will actually connect through service name one, which has got, you know, node one as preferred. and Apart from that, if in case node one goes down, it's redirected to the available node through the service name. So that is how high availability achieved, right? So what's happening is these two application servers, for example, are configured or 
you know have got the logic to accept a certain type of orders request and have got application modules in place that write to a specific schema and now it connects to the service that redirects the connection to node 1 all the time for schema 1 and now if node 1 goes down it connects to the available instance node 2 right the reason why they have actually started writing to individual nodes is because they understood that over a period of time after five years like when they are trying to write to the same schema on multiple nodes because of the interconnect or because of, or because of the global cache fusion right they were getting into a lot of contention issues and they started writing to the preferred nodes and now okay this was a history which was a kind of a good indication for us now Apart from the five schemas that actually take a lot of uh, data, I mean, a lot of writes, there was one global schema which actually is common for all the schemas. So when I say one global schema, it has got the SKUs and uh, vendor details and all that that is common for all the schemas. So all the transactions use that global schema and it depends on the global schema. Now, it they definitely need to write more so will they vertically scale the server can we create one postgresql node that actually can take care of all the writes and reads and have multiple slaves that can help a lot of reporting for read queries because you you know that a postgresql slave can take reads right just like the active data guard or i mean uh, just like the um, option that you have with uh, Oracle, like read only with apply the slaves, right? So, yeah, we were thinking to do that. And then we understood that over a period of time, they'll be writing a lot more. And we then thought about, okay, let's, instead of thinking about vertically scaling it, see if we can horizontally scale it, right? And then, yeah. And then what we actually thought about was this design, right? And uh, so we have one database, one database cluster, which is with two set of slaves. I'll tell you why we got to this structure a little better. So we have one database for independent individual schema, like schema one, schema two, schema three, schema four, and schema five. And for the common schema, we have actually got the application logic modified in such a way that because it is just a 250 megabyte schema which takes writes like hardly I would say like once in a month or once in every quarter when there is a new vendor list added or new set of SKUs added right so we modified the application logic I mean we suggested them to modify the application logic to write to all the databases the common schema just the common schema which is actually not a huge load for them so now we got away from that rack to kind of every schema has got a independent database cluster with two slaves right so before going there and explaining you that more right what are the steps that I feel as you know are actually involved in a migration first is a design we definitely need to understand how the existing architecture is and then see how we can actually you know go ahead and think about the current existing application architecture application layer see how we can modify that to see if we can improve it or like it's it's definitely the existing architecture and the history that's very important to go ahead and proceed with the design as we discussed and then business logic conversion there are several tools available to do that. We are talk we're going to talk about that as well. Data migration and post-migration. This is what I feel is involved in migration, but we could definitely get to a lot more stages, a lot more steps. So we also started analyzing the current Oracle production database. What's running in the Oracle production database at this point of time? Like starting even from CPU, memory, I.O., contention, what amount of bloat? is there in the Oracle database? Is there a partitioning enabled, archiving, purging jobs? And what is a working data set? You have several schemas, like five schemas, that are taking writes. 
on individual nodes, though it's an Oracle rack, right? But what is a working data set? What we understood was their reporting queries are actually running and uh, kind of, you know, they, for example, a schema one, I mean, uh, the, the node one that has got all the cache of schema one is actually taking reporting queries of schema four or schema five. So whichever node has got the lowest load, they start going ahead and running their reporting jobs there. So that way, the active data set that actually could sit in the cache, right, was kind of fluctuating. So we understood that in the beginning. And we also found out that like their tables are not being maintained properly. So the database size that they currently have could actually shrink to much lower size, even the tables. So we analyzed that first. So we went into the existing Oracle database architecture. We saw how it is performing and uh, what's happening in each of the nodes. What are the current issues? How many transactions are running? What are the tables that are actively uh, involved in transactions, right? What is the amount of data set that's actually involved in transactions? Because that helps us design the PostgreSQL database server. So this is something that we were discussing about some time back. Like each schema has uh, 150 individual application modules writing to it, and one common schema that is like 250 MB in size, and reporting running, reporting queries run on all the fine nodes, and for them, high availability is of course a concern. That is why they're using preferred and available, uh, preferred and available nodes, right? So this is what we designed: like one PostgreSQL high availability cluster one master and two slaves. Now, why did we choose one master and two slaves? It is because for them, license is a concern. Getting another server is not at all a concern. To enable high availability, most of us, what we do is, we have our master, which is a primary database server in one region, and we have our disaster recovery environment, like the slave, or standby in another region. Now, we wanted to set up two slaves, one in the same region as a master, and another one which is in a different region to enable high availability. And for them, one of the important, like as we are from Oracle background, right? Like we might have heard about something called flashback, right? Where I could go ahead and implement some DDLs or whatever changes I could do. I could create a restore point, and I could flash back my database to that restore point. Now, can that be possible with Postgres is what their question was. And for that, this was a solution that we have given. We could set up a delayed standby, right, which could be delayed by four hours. And their concern is gone. So if, you, if they would need to go ahead and, uh, um, you know, roll back the changes that they have done, they can automatically go ahead and switch to the delayed standby and promote it. And that's how they can go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, kind of flashback. And if you do not want to do that, in your environments, just like AWS says, like you could go ahead and uh, do, I mean, use our snapshots to do point in time recovery. You need to have better backup strategies using which you can achieve point in time recovery if you need to go ahead and roll back uh, your changes. And I'm going to talk about one more experiences that I had with uh, one of the recent Oracle uh, migrations uh, while I was working with Jim here, and um, how we have achieved uh, uh, you know, one more uh, strategy towards like versioning of changes. So I'll talk about that. And uh, for PostgreSQL-like databases, uh, make sure that you're reading about or knowing about uh, connection pooling, if you're already not aware of, uh, uh, aware of. So we implemented the well-known connection pooler, PG Bouncer, and HA proxy for connection pooling and load balancing. So HA proxy especially for load balancing, and PG Bouncer especially for connection pooler. Why a connection pooler is needed is just to ensure that we have persistent connections on the database that can be reusable. So opening a connection and closing a connection is a complex operation on the server. And uh, as Postgres is totally process-based, Postmaster forks another new process every time a connection is received, 
right? If it's not a persistent connection, that opening and closing the connection is always a complex operation, which could be resource intensive. And that is why you need to have a connection pooler in place if you do not have a perfect native application connection pooler. And it happened in their case. So we have gone ahead and uh, suggested them PG Bouncer. And that was installed on all the application servers. And you have two good solutions for high availability at this point of time for Postgres. There could be many that are coming up, but Rep Manager and Patroni. So you may want to look into that, which could allow you to enable automatic failover as well. So in Rep Manager, you'll have configuration file where you can go ahead and script your promote command. When I say script your promote command, to promote command, you can use a bash or a Python script, whatever you want. You can code the steps that you would manually perform in the event of a failover. That means, what is a failover? Master is not available. I want my slave to be promoted to a master. When I do that, I need to ensure that all my applications connect to the slave. And in order to let it connect to the slave, I may need to go ahead and modify the application connection strings. So the set of commands involved to do that and the set of commands involved to promote the slave can also be coded. And all that sequence of steps can be written as a script and passed to the rep manager. When the daemon detects that, it, it actually um, detects that you know the master is not reachable, it can go ahead and run that script as well. So depending on the environments that we are working on, we could modify our scripts in such a way. And likewise, we also have Petroni, and that's really getting popular with Postgres. I would uh, request you all to look into that. Um, you know, that, that uh, depends on kind of a, you could use HCD on top of it, which is more of a consensus-based algorithm, which detects who should be the leader, and uh, Petroni <laughs> will actually take it from there. So it has got, a good, it has got good APIs, which could be used uh, by HA proxy to, to detect who could be master, who could be slave. So everything, the failover can be automatic. So yeah, so I was just talking about uh, um, the connection pooler and the load balancing thing. So why load balancing? If you are getting any read requests, you can load balance a read request to both of your slaves as well. If you know that there can be some reporting queries that could be work, I mean, that could run on your delayed standby as well. If it's trying to look for some data, which is a day ago or more than a day ago, then it could actually be directed to even the delayed standby. And if you have any other reporting jobs that could connect to the slave, it can still connect. And I still remember the issue in Oracle, which is like snapshot to old error, because you maintain or we maintain um, a global undo image, the undo segments in Oracle. But in Postgres, every table has got its own undo, I would say, right? So uh, it's created as old, older versions. And uh, if Postgres understands that there is no such uh, query that's actually depending on that older version, that's the only time when it could actually get that off the table. I mean to say, there is a lot of process involved in that, like auto vacuum and the other things that we can read about. Yeah, and talking about the business logic migration, we have actually seen 150 stored procedures in them, but they're not as uh, complex stored procedures as we have thought about. We have used ORA to PG. You could also use um, ORA to PG, or depending on the uh, you know, uh, instance that you have selected or migrating to, you may want to use SCT, DMS. In ORA to PG, you'll have very good configurable options. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, where you can actually tell what is your Oracle database and what is your Postgres if you want to directly apply the changes after converting your Oracle schema to Postgres or you want to create script files. For example, you have 100 tables in you know, each of these schemas. When ORA2PG converts the schemas, it will create individual .SQL files for all the schemas. And at the same time, it can also create individual .SQL files for all the tables, procedures, or functions, views. So for all the type of database objects, it can. And at the same point of time, you can also migrate all your data 
using uh, or to PG, like you, I mean, it uses copy commands behind, and uh, you could even use parallelism, parallel processes in order to um, make that data migration faster. And you could also tell, like, for every chunk of records, like one million records, the uh, you need to have a parallel process created in order to migrate the data. And if you have modified, like, because we have modified the table structure. And um, there were few changes that were implemented where the schema got changed. So we even use foreign data wrappers in that case, where PostgreSQL can talk to the foreign server, which is the Oracle server, and select the data from there and insert it into Postgres. So Postgres can talk to another heterogeneous database using foreign data wrapper. Right? So that's, that's again, something that you could use. And um, so. You can, or you can all look into, I mean, there are several presentations in the past too uh, that have actually happened towards or PG, et cetera. So I didn't want to go more deeper into that and uh, bore everybody if they've already seen it. And then once we have done the migration, uh, like, you know, let's say all, all the stored procedures got converted. Now it's not that all the migration is completed and uh, um, all the, uh, I mean, the entire database is actually ready for uh, you know, like transactions. You need to tune it. And in order to tune your database, you need to have good resources that could actually help you do that. So if you're talking about stored procedures, how can I tune my stored procedures, right? You can explore more about PL Profiler. And uh, so that is um, a tool that could actually help you go ahead and look into the stored procedure call stack. When I say call stack, it's basically like every line of code, the time taken at every line of code or the SQL, you know, you could actually get an HTML report out of it and you could understand what is that line at which the execution time is a lot more. So PL Profiler can help us tune the stored procedures in PostgreSQL. So you just need to run PL Profiler for the function, and when you run that, it just generates an HTML report for you for the entire function code, and that report tells you, okay, this for loop is taking more time, or you know, this SQL statement that's running inside this for loop is taking more microseconds, so let me see if I can tune this SQL code, right? At the same time, if you would want to go ahead and look at the time-taking SQLs, in Oracle, we may, have, we may have the options of querying the DBA hist tables or you know, all the other tables that could actually help us see what are the SQLs that are taking more time and uh, what are the SQLs that, may to, that we may need to improve depending on uh, the you know, like execution times, et cetera. But in Postgres, everything is actually returned to the log file, right? So you can go ahead and uh, tune your parameters like log min duration statement that helps you capture all those statements that run for more than log min duration statement. Like you can set it to one microsecond or one millisecond or uh, one second or one hour, depending on the time that you set to it, those statements are log. And auto explain, that is something that actually helps you even capture the execution plans. One thing that you need to remember is in PostgreSQL, unlike Oracle, you don't have soft parsing all the time. So if you use prepared statements, the execution plan can be reused. But if you're not using prepared statements, it may have to go through hard parsing. And in that case, like if, if you would like to know any of your SQL has changed this execution plan, or what is the runtime execution plan of a specific SQL statement, if you would need to see that, right? Enable auto explain. So that would actually run an explain analyze output for you in the log file. So you can go ahead and let's say you want to run a function and you want to see what are the SQLs running inside it and what are the execution plans of individual SQLs. Enable like session level auto explain and run that, end the session. Only for that session, whatever you run within that session, the um, Results are captured into the log file. Open the log file and look at it. At the same time, tune log statement, log line prefix, so that you can configure the way the log should be printed in the log files. 
And on top of all this, you could actually go ahead and run your PG Badger report. So if you are new to Postgres, I think PG Badger is something that you need to look into, which is a log analyzer. And uh, it can run an HTML report out of the log files and get you, you know, some uh, viewable report. Like you can just click on it and say like time-consuming reports. Okay, these are the time. I mean, time-consuming queries. These are the time-consuming queries. Or what are the queries that are actually? Uh, I mean, like what are the number of logs, right? Or a lot of information related to vacuum. So all that can be visible in PG Badger report. So. All this actually helps you analyze the performance and concentrate on the queries that are taking more time or help you identify the problematic queries or help you identify the methods to tune your stored procedures, so running a PL profiler. And a few of the important parameters that you always need to tune for your PostgreSQL, right? Shared buffers. That is something like database buffer cache for your Oracle. So when I say database buffer cache for Oracle, um, you know that is the database's uh, memory, which has got which caches all the, you know it uses LRU algorithm and what are, whatever are the blocks frequently used, um, you know it caches them which can be reusable. However, as PostgreSQL is not direct I/O, we have been always looking at some magic numbers like eight GB set to shared buffers or documented 25% of RAM for shared buffers, right? But it may not be always true. For one of the POCs, I mean, especially this one too, we have observed that as we got more RAM, which can actually take all the active data set, setting a 75% of shared buffers has actually got more TPS than setting a lesser shared buffers. So it's not always true that less shared buffers would actually help us, but it always depends on the um, active data set as well as if your database, entire database can sit in memory, then there is no point setting uh, you know, 8 GB or 2 GB of shared buffers or 25% of RAM for shared buffers. So you need to ensure that you run a proper benchmarking before setting shared buffers. Without doing that, Let's not just go by the documented uh, formula. Workmem, look at the workmem carefully because I've seen an envi I've seen environments where they set like 512 megabytes of workmem, 200 MB of workmem. It is a sort memory, so every sort can actually take so much of memory from RAM, and your Postgres server could go out of memory. So you may be running a database that could just require 8 megabytes or 16 megabytes of workmen. Just see PGStat database and uh, see if you, are, if you have a lot more temp files generated or look at the explain and analyze report and see if more temp files are being generated after sort. And if yes, you may need to tune your workmen. But if no, look at the workmen that could actually help you. Auto vacuum always needs to be on. Um, ensure that you do not turn off your auto vacuum in Postgres when you migrate. Um, I mean, we see many discussions that uh, we have to go ahead and perform vacuuming on, um, like manually, and uh, it's not something that we could directly tune uh, in the Postgres server, but yes, it still needs to be on, and uh, you need to always tune table level vacuum settings like auto vacuum, vacuum scale factor, vacuum threshold or you know, analyze scale factor, analyze threshold, but always have some kind of manual activities, I mean manual vacuuming in place, which could be like a weekly job, or, I mean nightly job, or a weekend job that could go ahead and run a vacuum on the entire databases or, uh, or a set of selective tables, right? Maintenance work mem, if you're loading a lot of data, um, which could be even creating indexes, Maintenance work mem is something that could actually help you increase uh, the performance, especially when you're creating indexes or performing a vacuum. Having more maintenance work mem could help you do that. And uh, I've seen database environments where, um, like the default random page cost is set to four, and the sequence page cost is set to one. But recently, in one of the benchmarkings, I've seen that when I was using an SSD, and when I know that I've created efficient indexes, random page, of, random page cost of one was much better because uh, what it means is 
fetching an index page is more costlier than fetching a sequential page from a disk. So there, there could be a chance that Postgres could go or choose sequential page scan than uh, using an index. So if you are, I mean, nowadays everybody uses SSDs. So um, check if you need to tune your random page cost. And uh, never try to turn off full page writes and F-Sync unless you know why you're doing that. Uh, because you are actually compromising on the asset properties of Postgres, right? So that could lead to corruption or, you know, um, I mean, um, if, you, if, you need to perf if Postgres needs to perform crash recovery, it could fail doing that. So st stay careful. Uh, if you know that full page writes is actually improving performance, so you can disable it, that's not always true. Uh, you need to have good file system that could support you doing that, like a cow file system with journaling in place. And again, it is not for sure that it could help you. So it is by default on. And if you turn it to off, you may see very good TPS, but not always recommended, right? Wall compression. And um, wall, I mean, PostgreSQL writes all its walls to PGX log directory, which is by default in the data directory, which is like redo log files for Oracle, right? All those transaction logs um, like get generated into the PGX log until 9.6 or PG wall from Postgres 10. But I've seen in uh, OLTP environments where it, if it's actually a write intensive machine, it could generate a lot of walls. And that actually takes a lot of IOPS on the machine. And I did see great improvements when we enabled wall compression. That means you are actually writing less to the disk and not using up all the IOPS. So you can go ahead and enable wall compression if you would need to. Um, so that, that is something that writes lesser walls. For example, in the recent benchmarkings um, that I was doing, I could see that without wall compression, I could see 4,000 walls being generated, 4,000 GB of walls. And with wall compression, I could see like 1,900 walls. Right? So that's less writes to the file system. And at the same time, always try to distribute your walls um, or, you know, and the logs to multiple different file systems. Do not try to write your data, walls, as well as uh, everything else to the same file system, right? So log min duration statement, everything, we all discussed that. And finally, the checkpoint, right? Frequent checkpointing could actually be a concern, too, like you're writing a lot to the disk. So try to tune your checkpoint settings by tuning max wall size. So the wall size, the maximum amount of wall that has been generated, after which a checkpoint should be forced. Right? So we can set that to several tens of gigs, even depending on the amount of uh, transactions happening. And uh, at the same time, checkpoint timeout is something that forces the checkpoint after that time. And checkpoint target timeline. I've seen environments which they, you know, they set it to 0 0.9 as checkpoint ta target timeline. What it means? It means if checkpoint timeout is set to one hour, it means and when checkpoint target timeline is set to 0 0.9, Postgres has 90% of time before the next checkpoint to perform the writes, right? Like 90% in the sense like 54 minutes more in order to you know, scatter the writes after the checkpoint. So that is kind of something that, I mean, you are not strictly writing or flushing the disk with all the writes immediately, which could get you into performance issues. So it's distributing the rights. Um, and uh, hot standby feedback, right? Some of, I mean, some of the times we have seen customers complaining, like, any reporting queries I'm running on Postgres slave are getting terminated uh, because of some vacuum running or a DDL running on the master. Because master does not know that your slave is actually needing them. So in order to avoid that, turn on hot standby feedback, and even explore max standby streaming delay and archive delay. Um, that could actually help your slaves do not kill the long-running transactions if there is any change happening on the master. So all these uh, are very important. And now, 
question will be like, is everything possible on Oracle or available with Postgres? I would say it is like, um, um, it, it may not be readily available, but we can create it for sure. So when I say we can create it, for example, I'm not sure if everybody would have worked, um, uh, heard about addition-based redefinitioning in Oracle, right? There was one such feature called EBR in Oracle, which helps you, for example, you have 10 application servers, and you want to deploy some code changes into the application server. And now, that code changes could have also got relevant database changes. Now, to avoid the entire downtime for all the applications, you may want to first run your code changes on the first set of five servers and restart them. And when you do that, you need to also run some associated database changes. But the other five application servers, which do not have the code changes done yet, should be able to see the past image of the database. That means it is versioning in the database, just like GitHub. So I should be able to see one branch, and another app can see another branch. So that is something called addition-based redefinitioning that's available with Oracle. So when we were working on another project, like um, I have uh, Jim here, who actually suggested uh, at that point of time while I was working with him, uh, this way we can achieve it. So what we have done, we have used event triggers, and we have used search path, and got all that uh, magic done. So what we did is, on an event of an alter table, right, like an add column, drop column, or create index, create sequence, drop index, we have found all such DDL statements that could really trigger some change to the database. And if that event happens, we have created views using which, you know, like your, so f f what, what we have done was like just to, um, I mean, that could be a very huge topic, but um, for every schema that we have, we have created some kind of a addition schema, because in Oracle it's called additioning, right? Addition schema, that is a parent schema that has got views created on top of the exact schema. And also for every branch or every version you create, for every change or a DDL that you implement, for that table or the object for which you have implemented a table, I mean a change, it will have another view created in the new child schema. And your database, when it starts to connect, it needs to run a function in order to know which view it needs to connect to. So it's, it's based on all views, event triggers, and uh, search path. So it's just to tell that you know uh, everything that you want is possible. So we were able to implement versioning and even versioning in PostgreSQL, right? History. Can I look at what's happening in Postgres, right? I have PG stat statements for sure, which actually is a counter that you know that's an extension. When you when you create it, you can view or query the PG stat statements, and you can see what are all the SQLs that I've run so far. How many times have they run? What are the total number of executions? What is the total amount of time, minimum, average, shared, blocks, hit, local buffers, it all, all the details are there. So you can snapshot that and have snap IDs created for every snapshot you collect and try to you know, differentiate between each snap. So that way you actually know more about the history. So flashback, I already discussed about the delayed standby and point in time recovery. And other few extensions, PG buffer cache to see what's inside the PostgreSQL shared buffers, what tables are actively cached and used, what amount of table is already cached, PG pre -warm to warm up your cache in Postgres, right? PL profiler, important tool to tune your stored procedures. PL debugger, PG partman for partitioning, um, you know, until 9.6, and uh, again, partitioning since 10, Postgres 10, declarative partitioning, and even Postgres 11, not yet released, but uh, you could see once it's released that uh, it also supports hash partitioning. So a lot of advanced uh, features have been um, already being developed, but um, it's just that everything that we think, we can make it possible, um, it's just that we need to have a requirement, and we need to think about you know, the solution that we could put in to achieve it. And finally, the backups that we proposed, 
PG-based backup. You can also use backup solutions like PG Backrest or PG Barman, right? But you, you have Armin like, I mean, it may not be parallel, but you have something like Armin by default, like PG-based backup. And continuous archiving and PG-based backup could actually be a good backup strategy for you. And also have weekly PG dump and PG dump all in place to ensure that you are able to select or query your database and uh, ensure that your database is not in a corrupted stage, right? So if your PG dump is successful, it's not, it means that your database is not corrupted most of the times. And something like DBMS redefinitioning in Oracle, which rebuilds a table online, you can use PG repack that could actually help you rebuild a table online with some limitations, of course, and routine manual vacuuming, partition maintenance, reindexing, and archiving purging jobs. This is something that could actually, uh, these are a few of the maintenance operations that we've observed, you know, that could help you keep your PostgreSQL healthy. So what we need to understand by all these exercises, it, I may not have actually shown you um, how to use a specific tool or etc., but it's, it's just that, um, you know, you, you have a few extensions that actually help you achieve similar features as Oracle in Postgres, and also in order to uh, go ahead and keep your PostgreSQL up and running or tune your PostgreSQL, you do have a few extensions that allow you to do that. You have similar backup solutions as Oracle for Postgres, right? So even warming up the cache or talking about tuning your uh, SQLs or profiling your functions or, you know, anything, you always have all the tools around it that are still in place. And even to migrate your business logic, you have tools. So, yep, just to help you understand that, uh, if you're new to Postgres and if you want to get away from Oracle, um, it's not that it's complex, it's just that we need to think and start doing it. That's everything from my side. Any questions? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, is it fair to say, I mean, the very extensive migration that you've done, so, so is it fair to say that the main motivation was the saving in licensing costs? Because there was not a performance issue that, that you had to deal with, like if, I have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, because there are 800 GB and there are very few writes. So the majority of the workload would be in like, reporting, I would assume. Or uh, actually, they were taking 400 TPS. It's, it's huge rights as well. However, um, their problem statement, as I discussed, was after a few acquisitions, they started adding new vendors, and now they are actually um, increasing their TPS more. They start hitting more orders. Now they want to scale up. So they wanted to see, I mean, when we have analyzed the existing Oracle nodes, right, they were already hitting their 90% of load averages talking about you know, starting from CPU or everything. So it's a must that they need to upgrade their existing architecture, existing servers physically, right? So now they were kind of, should we vertically scale it up or should we add more nodes and um, scatter some kind of transactions to more nodes? But when we start writing to two new, I mean, one schema from two or three nodes, we had some contention issues in the past so we don't know what to do. And at this point of time, do you think we can also think about migrations to Postgres and try to tune Postgres to take this kind of uh, load? So it was not just the license cost. It was also scale up. So a lot of things involved. So at this point of time, they wanted to see if we can give a try to Postgres and achieve the same features with Postgres. We know we can achieve this with Oracle. We can improve the hardware. We can add more nodes or do whatever. But can we migrate to Postgres? and reduce the cost, at the same time achieve the same features, you know? So that, that's the main reason why um, this was in progress at that point of time. Just a follow-up question. I mean, did you do the migration in parallel, which means the existing hardware and UF was there and then you had a... Oh, yes, yes. We got new servers and switch and then decommission the old servers, yes. So the, I mean, the hardware and the OS were the same? There are changes, actually. There are changes. I mean, not much change. It belongs to the same family, like Red Hat, OEL, CentOS, so we use CentOS. So like when you say vendors, I mean, 
units so kind of a hosting uh, because you say like it added more vendors so i mean was it the manufacturing organization or kind of manufacturing and e-commerce especially e-commerce yeah yeah yes Yes. So to enable flashback-like features, um, they were interested in also getting a delayed standby, right? So when, I'm say, when I say delayed standby, it could be a standby that could be delayed by four hours of, you know, while applying. So it is like if you, if you look at the master and the first slave, right, the data that it has got may not be in the third slave, right, because it's a delayed standby. But that actually helps faster point in time recovery or a flashback mechanism like Oracle. Yes? Oh, the switchover, as I mentioned, it was like six hours, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, but the cutoff. Usually, every time when, when it's a huge migration, right, um, it, it is a huge cutoff for sure. But there are, I mean, like in the past, my friends and um, I have experience with even, like, you know, Jim, and there are too many people who have used, like, uh, um, you know, external, uh, even open source or the other tools, like, um, you know, even uh, the Pentaho or other ETL tools that actually help them create jobs that could migrate the data while the Oracle database is running and be in a sync. And even you can use Oracle's Golden Gate too, right? That can be a replication kind of thing. So it depends on the um, you know, uh, client. If they can achieve, I mean, if they are OK with the downtime, we could make it much planned. If they are not OK with the downtime, yes, there are solutions. Like people have used Golden Gate, people have used Pentaho and other ETL tools um, you know, that could help you create some jobs to replicate data. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know, like, um, like DBMS job or DBMS scheduler, I am only aware of PG agent, uh, but I may need to explore more on that. Yeah. It's also PG Cron. There's, there's probably half a dozen schedulers. Just look around for extensions. Yeah, there are a few, a few extensions that could actually help yeah, you doing that. Maybe the thing is, like, uh, we, we, we want, like, uh, some kind of thing which can be called on the point channel. Okay, like, not, because Tron and all that thing is, like, so it's yeah. kind of more end users, not DBMS. Yeah. Yeah. I hope no questions anymore. Okay. Thank you all.